Welcome to Natural Family Planning Conversation. I'm your host, Teresa Notari, the Assistant Director of the Natural Family Planning Program at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heart of Jesus, burning furnace of love, inflame our hearts for love of you and our neighbors. Send us your Holy Spirit that we may be animated by his love and give glory to God the Father in our lives. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's reflection, a topic of discussion, but really a reflection, is going to be on living God's plan for married love and the gift of life. And we're going to do that today through talking with uh, one couple's journey, uh, through embracing church teaching, and especially through uh, weathering the difficulties of infertility. And to help us uh, reflect on these challenging topics, I'd like to introduce you to Jennifer Klug, who is the uh, Executive Director of the National Association of Catholic Pastoral Musicians. Uh, Jennifer, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself so that before we jump into the hardcore content of the topic and let us know about your childhood, how you met your husband, uh, that kind of thing. <laughs> Happy to, Teresa. Thank you so much for inviting me into this conversation with you today. Uh, I am a cradle Catholic, born and raised on the North Shore of Boston. I uh, received all my sacraments in the same parish, and really, uh, Catholicism was a strong part of my life. Um, my parents uh, both lived Curcio, for those of you who are familiar with that. Um, they uh, lived the uh, marriage encounter weekend when I was just one, and to this day belong to a marriage encounter sharing group. In fact, uh, one of the couples they met throughout that journey, uh, the husband is actually the deacon who eventually uh, celebrated the marriage of my husband and I. So that's how much the Catholic Church was part of my life. I went to parochial school, K through 12, and the teachings of the Catholic Church meant so much to me. And I was fascinated with the lives of the saints and, and really fell in love with our liturgy from a very young age. Uh, and that path with a love of the liturgy led me to spending most of my career in Catholic higher education and eventually to this role as the executive director for the National Association of Pastoral Musicians. Uh, throughout this journey, God intervenes in very interesting ways, um, which you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about later. I, I met my husband in 1998 through a rather strange set of circumstances relating the internet. I always joke that my husband and I met online before anyone met online. <laughs> huh. And uh, it, it, was, uh, it was a long courtship and we were married in October of 2006. So we will be upcoming on our, our 18 year anniversary. That's, that's lovely. I, what did, did you say your, what you studied when you were in school? So did you did study liturgy? I, I did not study liturgy, but as an undergraduate, uh, I went to George Washington University that had a very, very robust Newman Center. So, it was wonderful to be able to practice my faith and really be surrounded by people my age who were equally passionate about their faith. Uh, then as a young professional, when I graduated, I moved back home to Boston and started working at Emanuel College in Boston. Uh, and I worked in the president's office and a stone's throw from the president's office was the college chapel. Oh, so yeah. again, the, the Holy Spirit was just drawing me into my faith, even when I didn't realize it. Right. So even with that healthy um, Catholic background and that that lovely sense of home with your religious beliefs, what did you understand about church teaching on married love and the gift of life and specifically natural family planning? Mm -hmm. What was your original mm -hmm. thought? Yeah, so I, I should add that my parents also were responsible for leading marriage preparation at our parish for 
the better part of two decades. And my mother always had a great saying. She said, you know, the, the Catholic theology, the sexual act is between a husband and wife. And therefore, if it's between a husband and wife, there's no need for birth control. And then therefore you welcome any life. So you don't have to worry about anything else. She said, that's of course the ideal situation. Uh, and, and that's, you know, certainly what my sister and I understood that we were called as married women and as married men, of course, to be open to life. Um, in my family though, we always told the story of my maternal grandparents who used the old school, you know, I'm gonna use air quotes here, rhythm method uh, to avoid having children and had nine. <laughs> and my great uncle, aunt and uncle who used it to achieve children and had zero. And that was the subtext surrounding natural family planning to sure. me for my entire childhood and young adulthood. Yeah, it was really steeped in the idea that the rhythm method doesn't work. Yeah, that uh, that's actually a common um, misunderstanding, both of the practical um, uh, methods of natural family planning. Even I have to say, the, the um, understanding of how to use the rhythm method, which was much more specific and actually rather um, effective at pregnancy avoidance, but people didn't really learn it correctly at the time. So there was another problem there. But the myth that church teaching says that you have to have children anytime you have sex is usually how the openness to life um, was um, confused uh, among lots of good Catholics. Um, uh, I can't tell you how many letters I still get to this day with um, solid hardcore Catholics writing to me asking, um, is it okay to have sex with their spouse um, and not want to have children? Well, yes, it is okay as long as you're discerning what God wants in your lives and you're also not doing anything to harm his plan. And that's where, of course, the beauty of natural family planning comes along because you can responsibly um, work with God uh, and according to um, the fertile times and infertile times of the cycle. But, you know, even my, my own mother and father who used the rhythm method, um, they didn't understand it at that time. Um, uh, they did have their four children um, and uh, it was news to my mom uh, many years later when I started working in this ministry uh, <laughs> to tell her about the method of natural family planning. Uh, in fact, she actually had all of her girlfriends <laughs> come over <laughs> to learn about it, which of course they were well past <laughs> childbearing years by then, but um, they just could not believe how revolutionary it was when they mm -hmm. all were trying to struggle learning rhythm at that time, calendar rhythm, which goes back to the 1930s, um, uh, that method. And as I said, um, the actual algorithms are, are actually pretty pretty strong and pretty good. It's just that people didn't learn them well. But in any case, enough of me uh, getting back <laughs> to you. So how did things start changing uh, with, with you deepening your understanding? Yes, uh, the, the time came in our, our marriage that we definitely wanted to increase our family. Uh, and I, I say increase our family because so often when people are trying to achieve pregnancy, they talk about starting their family. And as someone who doesn't have children, I firmly believe, and I know the church teaches that my husband and I are a family. We're a family of two. And, and so that's why I'm very specific in saying when the time came that we wanted to grow our family. Um, we, you know, we were, we were, you know, working to achieve pregnancy and it wasn't happening. Uh, and so we had, um, we had a visit with our, our OBGYN, which, you know, is where most women start. Uh, and I was about 35 at the time. And he said, you know what, it's, it's time to get some evaluation done. Um, I'm going to send you to a reproductive endocrinologist. 
and trusted my doctor and I said, okay. And just really presumed that that was the right path because that's what was being put in front of me. Um, to, to make this part of the story very short, uh, you know, all, all of our tests came back wonderful. And we were told that, you know, we were in that, that large group of, of people, you know, who were experiencing infertility that were quote unquote, unexplained. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I should add that uh, at, at this point in time, we had we did experience one very early pregnancy loss, uh, and it, it's it's really interesting talking to women who have lost pregnancies 30, 40, 50 years ago. I was given the same exact advice that was given 50 years ago. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, wait two cycles, and try again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, why hasn't this changed in fifty years? Mm, exactly. Yeah, and 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 so we went through the testing, and we were told, okay, unexplained infertility. So here are your options, and all of the options were medical interventions that. I knew from my childhood as a Catholic, as a very well-formed Catholic, flew in the face of Catholic teaching around this, this subject and um, really had a struggle to decide what I wanted to do or what we wanted to do as a couple. And, you know, of course my husband would never have me do anything that I did not want to do, particularly because as the woman, it's so many of those things are happening to your body. And we bluntly put our reservations aside. We said, yeah, sure, we're still going to be Catholic, but we're just going to put a pin in all that for the moment. And we proceeded down the path of assisted reproductive technology and still had no success. Wow. So now it's, you know, the physical impacts of it, the time, the financial impact of it as well. And we were having no success. Um, and, you know, it was that point we decided, okay, we need to take a pause. Um, in the midst of a whole bunch of life changes, buying a house, my father having triple bypass, and my husband starting a new job. Somehow, we discovered that we were expecting again. Oh, wow. And then we lost the pregnancy about three weeks later. Mm -hmm. And all of this, we were like, okay, well, but, but we, we really want to have a child. And so we decided to go to a different reproductive endocrinologist equally respected in the Washington area who looked at us point blank, blank and said, yep, your only option is IVF. Looking at everything, your only option is IVF. Well, okay, well, we, we need to think about this. We need to pray about this. Let's go back. And Teresa, it was one of those most fascinating experiences of my life because we knew we could figure out the financial resources for it. We, you know, had been through similar procedures already. So, okay, I, you know, I think physically and emotionally we can, we can handle this, but something just made us continue to hit pause. And at the time I didn't know why. Um, did, can I interrupt and ask, did you yeah. uh, think um, of church teaching? I know a lot of people don't understand why Catholic teaching um, prohibits use of certain assisted reproductive technologies like IVF, for example, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's, it's considered to be an assault against the unitive part of the couple's relationship and bringing a child right. into the right. world. Yeah. 
I mean, did that, that, that? That was absolutely weighing in our minds mm -hmm. that we felt like the steps we had taken before were, you know, obviously not in conformity with the church's teachings, but we hadn't like really, we, we felt like IVF was that big line in the sand. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and we were like, and we just, it, we just couldn't come to a point that we said, yes, this is what we want unequivocally. We're moving forward. Right. Um, and so we, you know, we, we talked to the doctors and we said, okay, we have all of the information. We'll let you know if, and when we're ready. Um, and, and this is where the, the Holy Spirit really starts to work, <laughs> work, work its magic. Um, I, I was working at Georgetown University at the time, and something brought me to a lecture on campus. You know, those days you have when you have so much on your plate and you have no business going to something that's not directly in the scope of your work. Exactly. It was one of those situations. And I said, you know what? This is really interesting. I want to go to this. And um, it was a, a, a talk about... Um, Catholic social teaching. Um, Father John Ensler from Catholic Charities was there. Father John is in residence at, at my home parish. Uh, so I thought, okay, this would be a great, wonderful thing. I'm going to go do this for myself today. And uh, there I had a chance meeting with Dr. Duane. Marguerite uh, Duane. Yep, yep. For our viewers, she's the executive director of uh, FACS, which is an organization that trains and um, uh, educates um, physicians about the science and methodology of natural family planning. Mm -hmm. Had this chance meeting with her um, and really gave her a few snippets of my story. And she looked at me and Dr. Duane is a, is a very direct woman. And she said, are you charting? <laughs> and I said, well, well she, are you charting? No. She said, here's my card, email me. And that chance meeting led to an email with her that led me into a natural family planning methodology, which eventually led us into a diagnosis. But it, it was that role of the Holy Spirit that I cannot, I, I, I cannot under, overstate the importance of it, that pause, 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 and then that prompting to go to the lecture. Well, and you know, when you say that pause, I often wonder too, we, we always forget, right, when we make petitions to God, Lord God, please give me direction, Lord God, please help us do the right thing. You know, you might utter that, that prayer in a moment, and then you kind of forget about it, but when you're pausing and your brain is not really, you know, directing you, right. that's really when the Holy Spirit is talking because he remembers your prayer and, um, and then he's going to help assist you in doing the Lord God's will. And, and that's just a thing of beauty, I think, um, uh, because what are the odds that Dr. Marguerite Duane would have been at this lecture and there you were, um, uh, being directed to NAPRA technology, right? Isn't that what um, she introduced yes. you as well? Yeah. Yeah. And again, for our participants who are, are watching this video, NAPRA technology is an ethical woman's healthcare uh, medical system that was basically um, developed by Dr. Thomas Hilders in Omaha, Nebraska, um, the founder, one of the co-founders of the Creighton model method of natural family mm -hmm. planning. Well as all of this training for physicians. So yeah, it, uh, the um, NAPRA technology has helped so many couples um, mm -hmm. ethically with their um, challenges of infertility. Uh, absolutely. And that led us to um, begin to work with, with the Creighton model of, of charting. I uh, found a wonderful local practitioner who really because of my age, at that point said, we really need to get you to a NAPRO physician sooner than later. So let's get some charting together. And again, the Holy Spirit at work, that was in 
May. Um, I think that would that would have been May of either 16 or 17. Um, and chant, she said, oh gosh, you know, I, there are a couple of people who are doing this, but there's this one doctor that I'd really love for you to see. In between the time, in, in maybe the course of eight weeks, she was talking about Dr. Christine Hemphill, who was still down in South Carolina at that time. And during that period of time, she was moving back up to Pennsylvania, which would be about two hours from where I live. Uh, and so just another bit of the Holy Spirit at work uh, to get me to, to see Dr. Hemphill. And uh, just a few visits and one month of blood work uh, and some tests later, Dr. Hemphill had a diagnosis for me. So from that was from May, beginning of May to the end of October, I finally had a diagnosis after mm -hmm. six plus years wow. of being in the wilderness with this vague, unexplained infertility diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been one of the gifts to to me and my husband of natural family planning is to know that the the pregnancies that were confirmed that we lost and for all we know maybe countless more that never got to the point that they would have shown up on on a, a blood test um that they weren't our fault you, you know I, I i i know for myself i really carried the sense of guilt like well as a woman what am i doing that i can't conceive mm -hmm. and to have that medical answer okay after you ovulate your body isn't producing enough progesterone and estrogen to send that signal to your body hey your uterus is a safe place and plant right Right. <laughs> and that there was a relatively inexpensive solution to it as well mm -hmm. that was all in conformity with the church's teachings right so uh, then w were you able to um get pregnant or 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 no at that point? so at the point we finally got the diagnosis i was closer to 41 at that yeah. point so i mean we we knew that it was a race against time we still knew it was a possibility. All things are possible with God. Uh, and and so we we were not able to achieve pregnancy, but we were also given the gift of that. I, I was just able to be that much healthier overall, because then we also unlocked other things about my health that we had no idea mm -hmm. were, were going on. Uh, and so overall, the process, not just reproductively, but from an overall perspective, was able to make me much healthier as well. And you know, that's what natural family planning physicians or physicians who are trained in an NFP method, uh, especially in APRO technology and in recent times we have um, FEM, which is fertility ed education medical management where they focus mm -hmm. in on the hormones as well. Um, they, they often speak about the woman's uh, menstrual cycle as the, the the health indicator of the woman or one of the major uh, arms of uh, understanding how healthy mm -hmm. a woman is. And we forget that um, introducing um, steroidal hormones, as in the birth control pill, uh, is not a good thing to do because it really masks what's going on in the woman's body um, because it's not, it's not part of her system, not really. Uh, right. and, uh, I know I've got, in recent years especially, I've had lots of natural family planning teachers contact me over the years saying, what could we do to help mothers and daughters to, you know, absolutely stay away from hormonal contraception uh, for their children? Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, thrust this upon girls as soon as they start menstruating, even claiming that um, the, um, the, um, hormonal steroids will regularize their cycles. Well, it's not going to do that. It, it's completely suppressing the system and, and holding it captive. That's what it's doing. Um, 
gosh, it even has an effect of, um, uh, gosh, harming uh, the bone development of a young girl, mm -hmm. uh, leading things later in life like osteoporosis and that sort of thing. So, so women don't really understand their cycles in general. They don't understand the menstrual cycle's link to their overall health. And, and they don't understand uh, this, this medical world of uh, various drugs like birth control pills that are really ultimately not good for them physically. Mm -hmm. um, well, and, and also in, in my case as a young woman, it, it was masking so many of the, the actual problems. And that was, that was my nurse practitioner's solution. Oh, here you go. Here's a prescription. Right. Right. Yeah. So when you were young, if you found out that you weren't producing enough progesterone and estrogen, there there are other ways to stimulate that in your body. Mm -hmm. With uh, yeah, and and again, how do we get in front of that that um, that trouble curve, right? Because mm -hmm. um, I think women, because technology, medical technology is so advanced at this point in time, um, many of us think, oh, we have time. We have time to think about when to settle down and get married. We have time to try to get pregnant. And you think your fertility is going to be there, and it may not. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem of assisted reproductive technologies, mm -hmm. which you explained, you know, really puts couples through such an, an emotional roller coaster and a physical mm -hmm. one, too. It's not yes. all that healthy for yes. a woman to hyperstimulate her ovaries, right? Uh, right. or, or do whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I think back to our marriage preparation where uh, a married couple gave a witness statement about natural flight milling planning. So, I mean, um, all, all credit to the Archdiocese of Atlanta, where we were living at the time for including such a session in, in their program. Um, you know, and, and I, I readily admit, Teresa, you know, because I, I, even as a, you know, I got, I was 30 when I got married, you know, so even as a 30 year old, I was, you know, kind of rolling my eyes, you know, uh, the old joke, oh, what do you call people who use natural family planning, who parents, you know, mm, exactly. that, that old joke, you know, that, that's absolutely what I had in, in my head. Um, and I, I, I always say, I wish somebody had really talked about the science behind what this is and didn't just talk about NFP writ large, but really got into the different methodologies and and explained it yeah. to the engaged couples in a in much more concrete way. Or heck, even you know, having women's groups and men's groups in, in college at, at Newman Centers and other Catholic communities explaining this and, and actually explaining, hey, it's a viable option. You know, it's, it's not a free for all, but it is a viable option. Right. Yeah. Uh, in terms of marriage prep, I can say in the dioceses, there's such great variety. Most dioceses lead with church teaching, which, which you need to do that when it comes <laughs> to natural family planning, because you have to explain the huge why. Why do we not allow artificial contraception, but we allow these educational methods where you learn about your body, where the couple works together with their combined fertility to understand the fertile window, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, if you don't understand the why, it's going to be very hard to change your behavior because these methods are completely uh, based on behavior change. And we're mm -hmm. talking about right. um, thing. Right. And, yeah. Uh, so the promiscuous life is not a good preparation for this. You know, and, and that's why, you know, I, I, I really felt this call to tell my story much more openly, to tell our story more openly, um, because I think so many times, whether, you know, whether it's marriage preparation or, or other settings, it, it, it's not the rule, um, but it generally seems predominant that you're hearing from a couple that has multiple children. 
Now, there, there may have been multiple losses in there. There might be been a period of difficulty in secondary infertility, absolutely. But that natural planning, planning message is often being delivered by couples with children. Right. And yeah. I really felt the call to share my story more openly to say, no, th this is this is something that is useful whether or not you are blessed with surviving children. Right, right. Um, and to, and to really hear that, be able to to um to to feel that call and be able to respond to it. Yeah, because um, couples are delaying marriage to later ages at this point in time. It it almost seems like it should be a staple of you have the couple who has the children giving the witness that you can use this to plan your pregnancies and effectively avoid pregnancy. And then to have the couple who is infertile to talk about what if something goes wrong. And um, as this elderly couple once said to me, oh my gosh, they were so touching. The woman was originally from Spain and the man was, I think, from Syria. They had a, a beautiful interreligious marriage. He was Muslim, she was Roman Catholic. And, and she said to me, because both of them wanted children desperately, and mm -hmm. I met her at her age, and I said to her, well, what happened? And she said, ah, the children, they did not come. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was a natural heartbreak, you know? It was just yeah. such a natural heartbreak. Um, when, what do you do? What do you mm -hmm. do if children don't come? And and I, I guess asking that of you now, if you can share some of, of your insights, how how does a couple grapple with that and decide, mm -hmm. well, should we adopt or should we take part in foster care or not go that route and do something different with um, you know, our need to to share our love with the world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that has been the challenge. Uh, and I am the first one to tell people we remain open to what the Holy Spirit is telling us. Uh, I, I have this running joke that sometimes the Holy Spirit taps you on the shoulder, like all those taps I was talking about before. And sometimes the Holy Spirit slaps you backside of the head. <laughs> I feel like the Holy Spirit may have to do some slapping for us to hear what it's trying to say. Right. Your knucklehead, pay attention. <laughs> right, right. So I, I I feel like just just like when Dr. Dwayne was literally set in my path, you know, the Holy Spirit <laughs> is going to set something in our path that tells us, hey, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Um what what it has meant is, you know, we're we're able to to take uh, take a step back, you know, as my uh, my my niece has just gone off to college this year, my sister is essentially an empty nester now, and we're we're very much almost at a similar point in life, even though she has children and and we don't, um, you know, being being able to um, spend spend time with one another to encourage each other in our personal passions and our, our professional pursuits um, to to be able to be uh, to be generous financially to causes that we feel strongly about um, because you know if, if we had children we'd be you know thinking about Catholic school tuition and <laughs> clothes and and because that's not part of our budget. We're very blessed that we're able to do things in in other places, uh, and in really spending that time honoring honoring each other as a couple. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, a dear friend of my husband's, a, a friend from high school and from college, said to said to John, "You know, my my wife and I are always really impressed because." we have our three kids and that's how we relate to each other around our three kids. But I'm going to be really honest and tell you, I don't know if she and I would relate to the same way, the same way to each other, if it was she and I. He said, I, and I'm just always so impressed with how you two have built this, the two of you. 
Um, and, and that's always really struck me that, you know, again, going to what I said earlier about being a family as the two of us and right. honoring that uh, right. is, is so important. Isn't that the challenge? It's so true. Um, just life, life in general can just sweep us all away where you mm -hmm. wind up becoming almost robotic in your relationships within the family. I mean, even um, I think when I think of the family, it's not only the nuclear family, but for me being Italian American, it's also the extended family. <laughs> I remember it was getting close to my mother's eldest sister, um, probably the, the last months of her life. And uh, my mother was last in the line of 12. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Aunt Rosie, when she was starting to get even more frail, she died in her 90s and she had arthritis. I mean, my sisters and I laugh because we often say now that we're aging, why did we think aging would be easy? Because we're not finding aging easy. Well, it was because my mother's eldest sisters, led by Aunt Rosie, made it look easy. The only thing they ever complained about was we weren't visiting them enough. <laughs> a bit. But, but I remember just helping her with something in the kitchen where I had that, that graced moment where you just stop and you really look at the person and mm -hmm. you realize mm -hmm. the utter preciousness of that person yeah. and, mm -hmm. and, and just how beautiful Aunt Rosie was, how adorable what a treasure in the family, in my life, et cetera. And it was like a fleeting moment. And then, you know, you're back to helping her with whatever in the kitchen. And I wish we could do more of that. And maybe we need to be more purposeful. purposeful. Uh, certainly couples with children need to do that. I can tell you that many natural family planning couples will, will specifically set aside date nights, you know, mm -hmm. a couple times a month, maybe weekly if they're lucky. To be able to take that time to be with each other as a couple, um, because their children, they'll be better for their children if they're best with each other, right? Um, I, I had mentioned that my parents were very involved in, in marriage encounter. As a child, almost every single Sunday night, we knew that they were out the door between 6.30 and 7 to go to someone's home for their faith sharing and we knew once every eight weeks or so that my sister and I had to excuse ourselves and go upstairs to our bedrooms early that that was that Sunday night time that was that time for my parents yeah to to work on their marriage specifically right, to, to be it, present to one another yeah it's not automatic um uh, before we end our conversation I do want to ask uh uh, and please tell me if this is too much, but did you decide um, against um, adopting? Is that something that you didn't feel called to? If you could kind of unpack that a little bit, because there might be some couples who are struggling with whether or not they should adopt or or participate in foster care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is a wonderful question and com completely inbounds uh, for me. Um, we, we made the decision that we were not called to a rotation of foster care. We knew that that was not an option for us. We have left adoption as one of the things that we've said, Holy Spirit, tell us if this is, is supposed to be part of the plan. Um, you know, at, we have talked about it and we've said that um, our ages, myself being in my late 40s and my husband being in his early 50s, that we would be called to ad adopt an older child. We we have talked about that. We know that's something that um, if we are prompted by the spirit, that's that's certainly a direction that we would go in. So we haven't we haven't made any decisions, uh, and I think that's um, that that is one of the important things to remind myself and and to also say to the, the listeners as well that. If you are not called to biological parenthood, you may be called to adoptive parenthood, and you may be called to spiritual parenthood. Um, for a long time, that whole concept of spiritual motherhood really rubbed me the wrong way. Um, because when you are grieving, the thought that you're not going to be a biological mother, 
the idea of spiritual motherhood, at least for myself, not going to speak for any other women, really rang hollow. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the kind of, oh, well, that's easy for you to say. You have biological children. You're telling me I should settle for this. You know, and, and really kind of coming to grips that spiritual motherhood means something different for every single person. Uh, and when I look to our example of Mary, who has her child in a barn as a teenager and 33 years later has to cradle her child as he's died. You yeah. don't get a better example of spiritual motherhood and biological motherhood than that. Yeah. Uh, and, and really that keeping that, that imagery in mind, um, has been really helpful for me. And, and again, it, it's it's staying focused in the Lord, being really working to hear the Holy Spirit. I, I think, and couples, couples usually cu couples who are uh, as engaged in their faith as as you are, um, they know the importance of taking that time to pray separately as well as as a couple. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, if if you really want that life of meaning that um, that true domestic church that you're building as a couple uh, where where you're welcoming children or you're welcoming others coming into your home filled with the Holy Spirit you've got to you've got to make that room to hear him in the quiet times of your day whether it's 15 minutes in the morning or you know a little bit before you go to bed uh, somewhere to take that time mm -hmm. because you're right uh, uh, being open and 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 knowing what God wants is so important, and and sometimes He's just way too subtle for me. You know, I I, I really do wish He'd hit me over the back side of the head a lot more. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm the first one to admit I missed a lot of the subtle cues. <laughs> the subtle cues, um, but I would I would think something like that of of being uh, an adoptive parent or a, a foster care parent. Um, I think that that he's going to build up that desire stronger so that a couple will notice it. And I have heard those testimonies from couples over the years saying things like, well, um, I wasn't talking to my husband about it. I just kept getting this idea. It just kept like coming up that we should mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. my mom's children, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden something um, serendipitous uh, serendipitously happened and 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 they mm -hmm. out each other that yeah. they were having the same ideas yeah. and yeah. so there you go um mm -hmm. it's 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 a it's a good it's a good soul check <laughs> <laughs> well jennifer thank you so much for sharing all of the the this your heartfelt story with us i i really do think it will benefit a lot of our viewers who um, will hopefully uh, listen to your story uh, as we, we go to uh, finish our conversation. Um, Thank why don't you. we end with uh, a glory be in the name yes, of the Father, Lord, 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 the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, and and the Holy Spirit Lord, as it was, as in, the was in the beginning, is now, is now and ever shall, shall be world without, without end. end. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you again so much. Um, you've been so generous to us. God bless. Thank you.